everybody, I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. Joining me now is congressional candidate George Latimer. George, thank you so much for joining me. Brittany, it's nice to be with you today. George, currently you serve as Westchester County Executive. You are now running for Congress. So take us down a walk through memory lane here. Can you talk about what made you want to jump into politics? Well, I think that, you know, in this particular moment in the United States, we really need those of us who would go to Congress to, to go there to be very rational and to focus on how do we try to address and solve problems that, that the country has. The county executive and my prior public experience as a state legislator and a local official, we, we have to focus on trying to get to an end result, not just to debate issues and have this ideological uh, boot fight go on and on and on. And, and it's pretty clear in Washington that there's a dysfunctional uh, breakdown. And, and both parties have something to blame. It's not just one party. So my sense of it is, is that, that what we need right now are people who go to Washington, and this is what I hope to be, who will focus on trying to get substantive results in issues that matter to us. We have issues of affordable housing. We have issues of environment, uh, the immigration issue, all those substantive issues. And there are disagreements over what to do about them. But it requires a certain amount of cooperation across the aisle certain amount of, of competence on policy, not just on the rhetoric that oftentimes becomes the uh, micro of politics. And so I would hope to add to that dialogue in a positive light of one individual congressman. I've served in the state legislature in New York as an assemblyman as a senator. I understand that one legislator does not pivot the whole institution, but if around the country there's a desire to see us be more substantive and get to get to tangible results, then I want to be a part of that effort. Many Americans, many voters have lost trust in Congress because of the political infighting, because of the political divide between parties. How do you see yourself working across the aisle? Well, I've done that already in my other levels of government. And I think one of the things that's instructive is when you work in local governments, a county government, we're a large government. We, I, I uh, govern over a million people in Westchester County. But we have both Republicans and Democrats in our county uh, legislative body, which I also served in previously and I was chair of. And in our state legislature, I've served in both houses, one of which was held by Republicans in the day. And and I think at, at the lower levels of government, we're a little bit out of the main spotlight. You get a lot less of the people that are doing performance art and, and much more about performance. And, and we're judged when we're meeting with our residents about did we solve this problem with that problem. We've had issues at the local level of flood, issues of housing, things that relate to uh, job growth and development. And they're very practical uh, problems that people have, and, and we solve them or we don't solve them, and we get held accountable for it. Somehow, when you go off to Washington, there's a bit of a disconnect. And as long as you're arguing on behalf of what a particular party's agenda is, that's adequate. But I don't think it is adequate, and I think the premise of your question is correct. People have lost faith and trust in government in general, and in specific in, in Washington. And I think they need some of us to go to just be sort of rational deal with the issues, come back home, explain what those choices are, and try to make common sense as best as we can. So let's talk about those top issues facing voters right now. We're talking about immigration, the economy, and inflation. How do you plan, A, on dealing with them, and B, reaching across the aisle to deal with them with Republicans as well? Well, the first thing is is to understand that that in a in a legislative body you have to work with other people and you have to have broad coalitions and sometimes those coalitions form issue by issue. Um, I might disagree with somebody on one issue, but we find common ground on a second issue. We work together where we agree. The idea of joining a splinter group and being with the splinter group through thick and thin is not a productive way to operate. You wind up isolating yourself, and you also wind up uh, being involved in more of the polemics of government rather than in policy. So the first thing is, is that uh, as a Democrat, working within the Democratic uh, uh, group, and I do have a uh, number of uh, individuals who are in Congress now who I served with in the state legislature, including Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffrey, who both members of the assembly together, you, uh, you develop a couple of areas of expertise where you're able to work with other colleagues and offer ideas and suggestions as they craft legislation or as they craft uh, fiscal policy programs that, that tie into whatever continuing resolutions are or in the budget in general. Affordable housing is a major issue where I am at. I'm in a suburb right outside of New York City. It's a desirable suburb. There's a lot of pressure, market pressure on housing prices, which, which drive the prices up. And people who are who are working for a living and, and both families, both spouses working, still have trouble affording a, a living environment here in an area like this. 
you need to be able to look at and address that issue in a reasonable way. There's quite a bit of concern about job growth. And, and as much as there are new technologies that are starting to move the economy forward, we have to make sure that those jobs are in technical areas, science, engineering, that those job opportunities are there so that people can uh, sort of go through the process necessary to train and to be able to compete for those jobs. And that's what's going to get through the next 30 years of their work on it. Some of the old technologies won't we'll get them there any further, but we have to be able to make those connections. Climate change is very important. I think we see uh, with the increased number of uh, storms, the intensity of storms, it's an issue out there. We have to develop strategies. We've had some of them to deal with them already, and we have to work through that. And so what do you do? You sit there representing, as I would, an urban and a suburban district uh, in and just outside of it and a little bit of the New York City suburb. And you look for people who have similar type districts and similar type problems. It may be a suburban a legislator outside of Philadelphia. It could be a, a resident of Ohio. It could be a, a Congress member who comes from uh, uh, Maryland. Those are areas that are somewhat similar to mine. I happen to live in those areas during my corporate years. So I see some of the similarities. Similarity. And so you find common ground on the issues to say. I've done that at the local level. We have Republican and Democratic county executives work together to prevent uh, polluted water in the Hudson River. And so you must do that, not let the differences that you have on some issues stand in the way of the compromise that you're seeking to find on other specific issues. That's a really interesting point. And I am curious, is there a member of Congress who is currently serving that is the type of lawmaker you want to emulate? Well, it's a good question. And, you know, I've, I've known a lot of them who I, I consider to be very capable people. Uh, in the state of New York, Joe Morelli, who represents the Rochester district, was the uh, majority leader of the New York State Assembly when I served there. Uh, I consider Joe a role model. He's younger than I am. A lot of them are. But uh, he's a role model, uh, I think, in the way you approach issues and policies. Pat Ryan, who I served with, uh, he was a county executive in one county as I was in a nearby neighboring county. I think it's proven to be a very effective congressman. And there are members on the Republican side of the aisle. I know that the campaigns are still ahead of us. Democrats want to win seats, not necessarily advantage Republicans. But there are some Republicans out there whose records I look at and I find on some issues that we'll find common ground. So, you know, I think, Brittany, the idea uh, for me when I go down uh, is, is to be flexible in the way I look at building friendships, relationships, that out of those friendships and relationships, coalitions. Uh, I'm not the kind of guy to defriend you if we disagree on an issue on Facebook or Twitter or something of that nature. But I think that mindset uh, amongst enough of us is how you begin the process of uh, finding out. You've described yourself, though, as a progressive Democrat. Do you think when Republicans look at that, they will take pause? I think the problem is the words that we use to describe things. Uh, we've come to define what is a progressive and then have a whole long list of uh, litmus test items. In my governing of Westchester County, I have done things that are progressive and things that are conservative. Uh, we, were the, we were the first county in New York State to provide free public bus transportation during the summertime, uh, which helped indigent individuals. We also managed to convert our bus fleet uh, to electric and hybrid electric to get off of fossil fuels. We've passed laws like a wage theft law to protect our day workers. We have uh, banned conversion therapy, which is important to the LGBTQ community. We've uh, uh, launched initiatives for child care, financial assistance, and black maternal health care. If you look at those issues, you'd say, hey, George, that's a very progressive record. At the same time, we've cut county property taxes over the last five years. We've fully funded the police, and we've had a decrease in violent crime in Westchester County. We honor our veterans, uh, and with a host of different programs and services. Look at those issues, you'd say, well, George, it's a pretty conservative thing. Is that who you are? And, and the reality is most people in this society hold views that run the gamut from one wing to the other. They may cluster on certain major issues that define you. But, but they're not as rigidly ideological as sometimes the lineups in Washington can be, where you have, you know, Matt Gates and a, a Marjorie Taylor Greene on one side, and you have members of the squad on the other side. So it seems to me that most people, and certainly in my district, which is both a suburban and an urban district, I've run in this turf, by the way, before. I've won for county executive uh, twice in what amounts to 80% of this congressional district. So I'm not an unknown quantity for the people who vote in the 16th district. Um, you show them by your results. What did you accomplish? Did you renovate a major uh, recreational facility that's beneficial to kids of color or 
uh, African American and Latino kid. That defines who you are, not your own demographics. Um, how do you how do you look at it? How do you judge uh, the way that we've gone about uh, uh, addressing infrastructure issues? Not just what you say about infrastructure, but what you actually do to fix sewer systems. A lot of this stuff is very interesting, Brittany. I understand that if I'm hanging out with my personal friends, I start talking about infrastructure, their eyes going so. But it's important, and if you can show that you've done something concrete and, and significant, then people understand that you're serious about the job. You're not just in it for the show time. No, I actually do find infrastructure and the infrastructure bill that was passed by by with bipartisan support just a few years ago fascinating. And I am curious, what do you make of these sort of litmus tests in politics these days on both sides of the aisle, where if you don't meet all the criteria, it's almost like you're written off? Well, unfortunately, that's true. And, and I think what happens, and, and I don't certainly blame you personally as part of about what I'm about to say. But I think media attention follows the person who says the most outrageous. If you say something outrageously conservative or outrageously uh, liberal on the spectrum, the cameras follow you and you wind up being spotlighted in certain settings. Certainly, cable television news is looking for eye clicks. They're looking for people who turn on. If a guy comes out and says, as I do, let's work together, let's try to solve problems, that's not particularly sexy. If you get somebody out there who accuses somebody of treason or uh, you know, some outrageous statement that gets attention. And many times people in politics, civil levels, not just in the House of Representatives, they're striving for attention more than they are trying to strive for what represents something that, that creates a positive result. So I think that's why you see a tendency toward ideological responses because the media finds it more interesting for viewers. But what's interesting for viewers may not be what's good for the body politic. And as people get turned off to government and politics, we run the risk of losing our democracy because people just look at it and say, I don't trust any of them. They're all liars. All they do is attack the other side. They're corrupt. And, and that becomes a self-fulfilling narrative. Let's talk about someone who's made a name for themselves since they joined Congress in 2021, and that is Representative Jamal Bowman. As you know, this is his congressional seat. So where do you differ from him politically? I think the important thing to understand is that I've established a record of public service as a state legislator and as a county manager. I'm offering the voters of this district a choice. Representative Bowman has functioned now. He's in Congress. He's done the things that he's done, uh, certainly discussable and debatable. I'm not pivoting my campaign on the back. I'm pivoting my campaign on the things that I've been able to accomplish in the way that I've gone about being a public official. Some of the stuff is very mundane. I've already identified that I intend to visit each of the different local governments and the community boards in the Bronx portion of the district on a regular basis. That isn't being done. I can do that. I have done it in the past. And by doing so, we, we develop new relationship between the Congress member and the people. I intend to hold uh, meetings with constituents. I, I've called them already, called the a town hall meeting with the big, you know, showtime type of thing. Much more low key and more frequently done. Um, the fact that those things haven't happened isn't why I'm running. I'm running because I offer to do those things going forward. I certainly would have voted for the infrastructure. That's an important pool of money. Hey, that's the pool of money that's going to be used to fix the Francis Scott Keepers in Maryland. So, you know, no matter what your ideological rationale was for it, it it's a weak rationale. And, and that should have been unanimous. Just last night, uh, as we're speaking today, uh, there was a vote in which uh, the vast majority of members of the House of Representatives voted to take away tax exemptions from those not-for-profits that work uh, with terrorist groups. How can you possibly want to see a group that works with terrorist groups receive tax benefit from the, the government of the United States? Here in New York, we saw what happened on 9-11. We saw neighbors and friends die because of terrorism. And uh, whatever the rationale is, I don't know how you could vote no on it. I certainly would vote yes on it no like that. And I think that's the mindset that I've taken. So it's less about the, the boxing match between me and the economy. It's much more about you have a choice. There's two different paths here. And I'm offering, I think, a very substantive and significant path as an alternative direction. If you want something different, then I'm offering that as a representative Congress. Sure. So you said you would have voted for the bipartisan infrastructure bill. He voted against it. He's also made some commentary on Israel that has garnered national attention. He's repeatedly called for a total ceasefire. 
Are those calls that you echo, what, what's your stance on when it comes to the Israel-Hamas war? Well, you know, I, I think it's very simple. Hamas launched a vicious terrorist attack on October 7th. Killed 1,400 people, and they took X number of hostages. I forget the original number. Some have been uh, released. But they still hold, uh, and perhaps not alive anymore, a certain number of hostages. You should sit at the peace you should, you should have a ceasefire, and you should be able to negotiate humanitarian aid. But you must give back the hostage. Hamas has been unwilling to do that. I don't know how you can talk about peace with ceasefire if it isn't understood that the people that you kidnapped, these were, these were kids going to a festival, a music festival. You snatched them, and now you have them in custody. You probably killed most of them. We've heard many stories of women being raped and, and brutalized. You must return those people. And if they're old, you have to return their remains so that people can have closure. When you lose a loved one, you need that closure to know that you're finally saying goodbye. That has to be a part of what happens. So I don't know how a person can just blithely say, well, there should be ceasefire, uh, and that's it. Yes, as part of an arrangement by which the hostage is released. That's what I'd say. So you're saying ceasefire is only contingent if the hostages are released? It should be part of a, of a negotiated package because we understand that what we want to get to is a lasting peace. You are not going to get to a lasting peace. If you have a ceasefire, one of the combatants have held on to hostages that they have no right to have. That has to be part of whatever that arrangement is. And let me add, Brittany, I've said that humanitarian aid has to be provided. You have to protect those who are non-combatants. That's what was so heinous about Hamas. It wasn't an attack on a military institution where, where soldiers fought back. It attacked civilians. People in their homes were murdered and snatched out of their homes. So you have to be able to, to, to set a new platform upon which discussion towards peace can happen. And it begins with release of the hostages, ceasefire, humanitarian. All is part of the package. This weekend, we saw an unprecedented attack. Iran attacked Israel, and President Biden said that he called Prime Minister Netanyahu, quote, to reaffirm America's ironclad commitment to the security of Israel. But reports also indicate that the president also told him that the United States is not going to support an Israeli offensive on Iran. Do you agree with the United States' response here? What do you think of their Middle East policy as a whole? Well, in general, and, and this is a belief I've had being a legislator at other levels of government, where there were governors and mayors, and now as an executive myself, I think it's important in foreign policy for there to be a singular voice speaking for America. In this case, it's the President of the United States, his key uh, And I don't think every Congress member commenting with every nuance makes sense. And of course, as a challenger for Congress, I'm not privy to State Department reports and things that would help me make it more important. Uh, America did the right thing by standing by Israel, helping them shoot down the incoming rockets and uh, drone strikes. Uh, that was an attack by Iran on Israel. The response that Israel has, having successfully defended themselves with the United States, ought to be very thoughtful and measured before there's any further uh, response. But I will leave that for the president to negotiate. He has a relationship with Mr. Netanyahu, uh, and I'm not sure that uh, if Benjamin Netanyahu doesn't care what Chuck Schumer says, he doesn't care much about what George Latimer says, if he ever found him in the record of conditions. It's much more important, I think, that the president have the leverage necessary to negotiate the best possible. The primary in New York is in June. What's next for your campaign between now and then? Well, there all of the mechanics of the campaign are underway. We've got a very good campaign team. We've done very well fundraising money, over $3.3 uh, I'm not sure that's fully appreciated. And the majority of the money that we've raised has come from within our district. That's important. We haven't tapped into a nationwide network of donors, ideological donors. We've raised it from within our, our turf in Westchester, the Bronx. Uh, we have a very strong team that's out functioning. We have lots of volunteers that are helping us. I'm out in the community doing the things that campaigners do. A lot of it's very uh, mundane, but I'm meeting voters in a host of different settings. Uh, we went out to petition to get on the ballot. We, uh, we provided more petitions, 2,000 more petition signatures than the incumbent did. Uh, in addition to our fundraising advantage, uh, we're up on television with uh, television ads. We intend to be up throughout the course of the campaign. We'll be in mailbox pretty soon. And uh, suburban politics being what it is, lawn signs on your lawn. How's that for a high uh, But the, the bottom line is we intend to work vigorously right up to primary day. Early voting starts Saturday, June 15th. 
and voting itself is Tuesday, June 23rd. I take nothing for granted. I've had electoral success in the past, but every race is different. Um, and as you can tell by my demeanor, the words that I've said, I'm not in this blasting my opponent. I've had to deal with incoming blasts. But I know that the vast majority of voters don't care about that. What they care about is whether or not I can articulate a way to, for them to have a better experience if I'm in Congress. And that's the message I'm trying to deliver. With. George Latimer, I really appreciate the conversation today. Best of luck to you. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much for taking the time.